Last stop. Hi, I'm Johnny. This is Johnny Likes, the show where I talk about movies that are like. Today, I'm talking about one of the most hated sequels in movie history. Today, Johnny Likes Highlander 2. You tell him, Johnny. You tell the world. As a sequel to the beloved original, it fails on nearly every level. But, as a standalone cheesy sci-fi action movie, it's not bad. It's at least better than I remember it being. Then again, I also have a soft spot for notoriously bad movies, so take that as you will. The main reason I actually chose this movie for this week is because it takes place in 2024, and in real life, it's the first week of 2024, and I always find it fascinating where movies are set in the future, and it's now the present. So I have to specify that I'm talking about the director's cut of Highlander 2, not the theatrical version. This is one of those times where it actually makes a huge difference. The director's cut is still a mess, and seemingly no amount of tinkering can really save the film, but it's a much better mess. It's got about 20 minutes of added runtime, they used many alternate takes, and they resequenced lots of events, and they even touched up the FX in places. IMDB has a great rundown about all the specific little changes, but the highlights are that the sky shield is now blue, as was originally intended, instead of red, and that the whole alien aspect of the story is traded out for a time travel aspect instead. The plot. Okay, my god, the plot for this goes something along these lines. The year is 2024. The year is 2024, and for the last 25 years, the Earth has had a protective force field dome around it to protect from solar radiation due to the depletion of the ozone layer. Connor McLeod is now an aging old man, and he's one of the guys responsible for getting the shield in place. Well, at the opera, he starts to get flashbacks from long, long ago, before the events in the first Highlander movie, of when he and Ramirez led an uprising against the evil General Katana. During this time, Ramirez and McLeod get judged by a council of elders, and are sentenced to serve their sentence in the future? There's a great tongue-in-cheek scene where Virginia Madsen's character, Louise Marcus, tries to sum up what is going on. Okay, now let me just see if I can get this straight. You're mortal there, but you're immortal here until you kill all the guys from there who have come here, and then you're mortal here. Unless you go back there, or some more guys from there come here, in which case you become immortal here. Again. Something like that. Now that that's cleared up, I should mention that Louise Marcus is the leader of a rebel group that believes that the shield is no longer necessary and that the ozone has healed itself. Her and Connor hit it off because why not? You gotta have a love interest because reasons, I guess. Also, Katana sent a couple of assassins to the future to take out Connor and they failed and Connor soaked up their Highlander power and now he's young again. And so Katana comes to the future to take care of Connor himself. Oh, and because McLeod and Ramirez stuck their fingers in some goo and touched tips way in the past, they're now somehow linked beyond death. So Ramirez gets resurrected so he could be in the movie. And also, the corporation that runs the protective shield for the Earth, which is cleverly named the Shield Corporation, uh, their CEO wants Connor dead because Connor's buddy Naaman showed Connor that the shield is no longer necessary and so now Connor is all on board with Marcus to shut down the shield. Katana approaches the CEO of the shield corporation and they form a tentative alliance in order to kill Connor because he's their mutual enemy. So for the final act we have McLeod, Ramirez, and Marcus pitted against Katana and the S.H.I.E.L.D. Corporation as our crew break in to try and manually shut the S.H.I.E.L.D. down. So yeah, the story's a complete mess. But the movie actually looks great. The matte paintings combined with the sets and the miniatures make for a great look. The mega structures look appropriately grand, imposing, and futuristic. To all power sources around the world, this is TSC. We are ready to receive. 
The sets are pretty epic in scale, and the cinematography and action are well done. It's very much got this late 80s, early 90s look. You have this steely blue light being filtered into industrial settings through these huge spinning wall and ceiling fans. It's always wet or raining outside at night. It's a classic look of the time, and if you've seen movies from the period, it'll look very familiar to you. At least here the blue light makes sense because of the shield, so I gotta give it that. The two assassins sent for the past have a pretty cool cyberpunk meets the road warrior aesthetic going on. To me it looked as if they found the warehouse where they stored the still suits from David Lynch's Dune, helped themselves, and then on the way out somehow found some early night vision goggles and thought, hey, why not? That was kind of the extent of their look, but it still worked for me and I thought they were fun. It also didn't hurt that they got to sport some cool hoverboards and do a pretty nifty mid-air fight sequence with McCloud. I actually like the whole scene where they're fighting McCloud in the streets of LA. I think they're in LA. It might not be LA. It might be New York. It, it doesn't really matter. Tell me in the comments if you know. It was exciting and it was a definite highlight of the movie. Another thing that the movie has going for it is that the leads are all played by A-level actors. Okay, maybe not Lambert, but he still tries his best and he does pretty good here. But Sean Connery, Virginia Madsen, Michael Ironside, and John C. McGinley, that rounds out our leads, they're all very good actors. Ironside and McGinley stated that they hammed it up on purpose, just for fun, and it makes for some memorable performances. Virginia Madsen is always good, and Sean Connery is just being Sean Connery. In fact, it's well known that the dark-haired ladies So despite the weakness of the source material, the actors still try their best to bring it all to life, and they do a pretty solid job. This should have been modified into a standalone movie. It has nearly nothing in common with the first Highlander movie, apart from having Lambert and Connery return, and also having Russell Mulcahy back in the director's chair. He's actually a solid director, by the way. He's done some stuff I really like. You should check out The Shadow and Razorback and his extensive music video catalog if you're interested. If they would have cut out the Highlander aspects completely and just made the original Alien story, I think it would have worked a lot better and it could have even become a cult classic. I think it's kind of a cool idea having these aliens transported to Earth to fight. It, it, it's kind of fun. The problem is, it just doesn't mesh with the Highlander lore. As it is, I think that the director's cut works as a cheesy sci-fi action movie. If you're a fan of the genre and the time period, and you haven't seen this movie since it came out because you're still pissed at how bad it was compared to the first one, maybe it's time to give this one a rewatch. With the right attitude, you might even have fun. And by right attitude, I mean you have to be craving a cheesy early 90s sci-fi action movie. And you also have to turn your critical thinking skills way down. Kinda like this. Defense! <laughs> Defense! <laughs> uh, that's pretty dumb, but uh... Extended warranty? How can I lose? Perfect. It also helps if you either haven't seen the original Highlander, or if you just think of this as a standalone movie. With all that said, I'm going to rate this a 2.75 out of 5. It's still not very good, but it does have enough memorable and redeemable qualities to get a pass from me, and even a very hesitant and caveat-filled recommendation. So what do you guys think of Highlander 2? Be it the theatrical, the director's cut, renegade version, special edition, and what do you think is the worst sequel ever made? Let me know in the comments. And if you could do me a favor while you're here and click the like and the subscribe buttons, that'd be outstanding. It is quick, free, and relatively painless. If you don't want to, okay, I'll get you next time. Thanks for watching me talk about movies for a little bit, and you can tune in next time to see what else Johnny likes. Next week it might even be good.